Yes. Oh my goodness, that was unbelievable, Todd. <laughs> I am just, I'm in awe. Welcome Thank to you. Drumeo, man. And thanks for everyone for watching. If you guys don't know who this is yet, it's Todd Zuckerman, uh, one of the legends, man. I, I gotta say, I've been following you. It feels like it's a Yeah, China. I know, I gotta be back it's a China on the way here. But I've been following you for a long time. I loved your Method of Mechanics series, both one and two. I learned a lot Thank from you. it. Love your quick tips and all that, man. <laughs> quick, uh, tip. quick tips. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you on Drumeo. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, and uh, man, all you guys have been just amazing. It's an amazing complex here, and everybody's so cool. Oh, thank it's, you. It's, it's wonderful to finally be here and yeah. see what you've got going on here. It's magnificent. Very cool. Well, you're in for a treat, everyone. Uh, like I said, it's Todd Zuckerman. He's the main drummer for Styx. He also has won a lot of accolades. In 2009, you won Modern Drummer Reader's Poll number one drummer. Uh, rock drummer. Sorry, modern rock, rock drummer. Um, 2015, you won the number one progressive rock drummer. And, uh, I don't know how that happened. You also won the best clinician in, uh, a voted number one clinician in Drum Magazine. Um, you're a world class educator, man, and you're a world class you. player as well. You have a really cool sound to it. This is, uh, or to your playing, sorry, this is a really cool setup as well. I want to thank all the sponsors to help bring you here and this kit. Pearl, for example, thank you so much for sending this kit. It's amazing. Uh, Remo as well, Promark Sticks, Sabian Cymbals, uh, Audix Mics. We've got a whole new set of Audix Mics mm -hmm. in for you as well. Um, and uh, even Hudson Music for supplying us with some DVDs and a book to give away as well. Um, and also the Carmichael Throne you're sitting on there, which is really yes. cool as well. Am I missing anyone? No, that's everybody. And thank you for coming through, especially Pearl for shipping this across uh, Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's very comfy to have... Uh yeah, you're your like, friends here. You're like right, right at home here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, if you guys want to follow Todd, find him on online, toddsuckerman.com. You can also find him on Facebook, uh, Instagram as well, at Todd Sukerman. So uh, make sure you follow him because I mean, there's a ton of great clips and videos you share and you're always on the road playing with sticks or uh, another band or doing some clinics and all that kind of stuff as well. So yeah. you're in for a cool lesson. It's called, um, basically, it's, it's Sounds and Choices more methods and mechanics. Um, so this is a kind of a lesson that's gonna be a lot more conceptual, but it's gonna include a lot of cool tips on how to uh, fine tune your sound to get better, well, to get better sounds out of your instrument um, easier with less effort. So I will stop talking here and let you take it away, Todd. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm very fortunate to learn a lot about what I do and what we do by teaching because all of a sudden you have to verbalize and convey an idea that you might intrinsically know uh, and uh, haven't thought you know to, to convey that idea so really the impetus for me doing the first methods in mechanics w was that I had a couple students that could blaze on double bass drum and they were doing crossing things and twirling their sticks and they wanted to know about playing in 1916 and polyrhythms but you know they couldn't play four bars of solid time without it sucking or them stymieing or something. And they've just spent so much time on the wrong thing. You, you have to be able to walk before you can run. And you have to be able to walk well and with a swagger before you start learning all that stuff. Because what those guys did was basically set themselves up for a lifetime of heartache and pain and broken dreams. Um, so that was the impetus for, and the inspiration for me doing methods and mechanics in the first place. Because I wanted to be a galvanizing voice of reason to help convey ideas that would be useful and help drummers become employable and, and, and play useful things. And yes, there's, we all like to play if we're able to do that, but yeah. again, there's, there's steps to get there. Um, and most recently, uh, the, over the last couple of years, I would do like a Facebook blast and I'd say, hey, I'm home and I'm opening up this week to do lessons, uh, you know, serious inquiries only. And so I've, I've had about, you know, maybe 40 or 50 people over at the house over the last two years. And every one of these players, they, they work, whether it's they're just playing on weekends or they play at their church or they actually do records and tours. People flew in from all over the place and drove in and would take, you know, a two or three, four hour lesson. Mm -hmm. And being that it's, <laughs> it's not a situation where work on th these ideas and we'll see you next Wednesday at three. Yeah. I look at myself as more of a coach where I will sit and watch someone play the drums, listen to someone play the drums, and I can hopefully identify some problems uh, that the individuals are having sounding good, 
They're sounding great even on the drum set. And a lot of those things come down to physical a attributes, where things are on the, the drum set, their balance, their, their mixes, and where, where and how they hit the drums. Um, so that's what I, 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 I try to do. And one thing that I did notice with all these players um, was that some of the basics might not be so basic. And I know a lot of times, like, oh, let's get back to basics, and some of the, you know, the drummers with more experience out there might, might groan. But, but hold on. I, I sort of thought more people had a handle on certain things. Mm. And just because you might present an idea in a DVD or hear and you see it doesn't mean that you now know it. Mm -hmm. You have to actually implement that into your playing. So the first thing when I see someone play and I want to see them play on the snare drum or play time is the first thing I, I look at their hands. Mm -hmm. And if players are holding their sticks tightly and there's no space between that f the first finger and the thumb, I know, okay, we got to start right there. Mm. The reason it's important to, to leave a space between the thumb and the first finger is all these muscles are loose. You know, stop, grab a stick, do this. All these muscles are loose. Now grab the stick like that or do this thing the way a lot of kids are taught. All those muscles are tight. So, when you see a guy... You, know, you, you see a guy do that for 10 minutes, you wonder how that can be done. Well, that's the only way it could be done. If I tried to do that, grabbing the stick like this, yeah. here's what happens. Done. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. You know, tension all the way up the arm into the neck. Uh, so that's a very, very important thing. And same thing here, when, when, when I'm coming down, the times that I play match grip, it's still a whip into the, into the crack. And same thing here, I'm very loose, where I mostly play traditional grip. It's pretty loose right in there. So I know for some of you younger drummers out there, you hear, hear a teacher say, oh, be loose, be loose. And, and you know, you get a deer in the headlight sort of look. Yeah. Well, yeah. The sticks aren't going to fly out of your hands, and if they do, so what? Grab another stick, you know what I mean? The sticks fly out of my hands all the time. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to play certain things, and I've been playing drums for 45 years now, you know, for the most part injury-free, so I know I'm doing something sort of right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in being loose, that's going to help you play faster, longer, and if you're relaxed, no matter what, your do, if you're a golfer or an NBA player, a basketball player, or an actor or an architect, guitarist, a drummer, or whatever, whatever job you do, if you're relaxed, you're going to do it better. So part of being relaxed is being loose. And being able to sit at the drums, shoulders down. Well, check this out as an example. So if I were to play like fast triplets, you know, using sort of a bastardized molar. Okay, I got, I have the space there. And it's all coming from here. And that sound is sort of like a, a, a butterfly. It's very easy. Even though it's fast, it doesn't feel like a Tommy gun. Mm -hmm. So again... Now, conversely, if I want the sound to feel more tense or urgent, then I can put some tenseness and some muscle into it, like this. So I'll go from a butterfly to the jackhammer. Yeah. Now we're being sound-driven. Mm -hmm. I made the conscious decision to go from the, the easy flow of it Yeah. To, 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 that, to that tension. But there's a lot of drummers out there, I feel that they, they just, all they can do is, is just muscle it out. And they don't get that looseness, which is a different sound. And this, I could do this all day long. That is, that is taking like zero effort, pretty wow. much. Wow, yeah, yeah. So it's a matter of sort of just aligning yourself with the physics of, Having the, 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 the stick feel light and airy and being loose and having that space, okay? 
So you say, uh, you know, you get the deer in the headlights look. Um, what, what do we do as drummers to make sure that we're staying loose and, not, and that without, you know, worrying about our technique being wrong? It's a great, great question. Get, you know, go to, you know, Target or something like that. You got Target up here? We have a Walmart. Okay. Uh, Close enough. No, don't give them your money. Um, <laughs> go somewhere else <laughs> and get, you know, get a mirror. Get one of those cheap, you yeah. know, $10 mirrors that you can hang on the, sure. the back of a closet. And make sure that, that you're... That, you, that you're loose, okay? Check it out because you're, you're gonna fall into the, your old habits because it's, that's just what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. The moment your mind goes somewhere else, your old habits are gonna take over. So it's something that you have to consciously uh, train yourself to do. And once you do, you'll never not play that way because it's, it's, you've aligned yourself with the, the proper physics. It's weird, some things that are natural to do aren't natural to learn. But once you learn them and implement them, th that will be your default way of playing. And it's gonna sound and feel way better. Uh, another couple things on, on grip sure. real quick. Yeah. Um, the, the hand will change from wherever I am on, on the drum set. So this feels natural to me. This doesn't feel natural. What would be over here wouldn't feel natural on the right cymbal. Same thing over here. My, my first finger is actually the least useful finger on, on my right hand. Sort of, the, to me, the magic is going on in the, the fulcrum in, in the, the second finger. Uh, the great Peter Erskine, I saw him do a bit where he talked about the way to grab a stick. He'd be like, you're saying, bad dog, bad dog. <laughs> there you go. Bad dog. Okay? <laughs> That's great. Uh, and Steve Smith calls this the, the Tony Williams grip. I actually employ this in a lot of my rock drumming, especially going over here on the floor toms. Or the, or the gong drum. Mm -hmm. I'm not holding this as the fulcrum. I'm gonna whack the gong drum. Go for it. And that just feels, that feels great here because you get a lot of power and a lot of snap. So that's sort of some magic sauce that's going on uh, here in, when I'm playing rock drums or hitting the crashes over here. And that's also pretty loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at that. All these are. Spongy. Yeah. So uh, another thing that's going to make you feel relaxed is your posture. Mm -hmm. So I don't always have the best posture, but I try to sit up straight, and I try not to lean over. I mean, every now and then something might feel cool to do that, but some, some drummers that are always hunching over or doing something, they're going to end up with some sort of back problems, uh, some sort of injury at some point. So uh, when students would come over and I'd see them do this, I'd say, well, wait, why, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. I don't know is always the answer. Yeah, okay. And I'd stand behind them and I'd grab them and I'd put them back. You know, I know a little bit of that's okay, but there's, there's dudes that, you know, that, and that's not a relaxed position to yeah. play. Yeah. You know, you go play drums for three hours like this. <clears throat> no doubt, yeah. You know, um, and that also comes into how you set up your drums that will benefit the, the way that you play and the sound that you get out of it. Um, when students come over, I say, it's very important. I want you to put your hi-hat and your snare drum in your seat where you always do it and what, what's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, they'll have the snare drum really low and angled towards them. And it's fine if you're a match grip player, but some of these guys are hitting their thighs mm -hmm. and they're hitting the snare drum. It might work for some people. Phil Collins kind of does that and he's, uh, he's one of the greatest of all time. So, but yeah. uh, it's a special case. For me, my concept is, oh, well, I'd say, here, set up your snare drum and your hi-hat your bass drum. And almost every one of them would say, you know, I'd love to play traditional grip, but I just could never get it going on. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, well, no kidding. You can't. You physically can't play traditional grip with your snare drum down there unless you turn your arm into some weird crustacean mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. You know, you physically can't do it. So yeah. they've, they've set themselves up to fail straight away f for that. So I can, t I can tell you why every single piece of gear is on this drum set, why it's there. Mm. But right now, in, in talking about the, 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 the kick, snare, and hat, or especially the snare drum, I do play mostly traditional grit. So look at this line right here. I'm coming down, bam. 
And this snare drum is set up where I could, I could type on it. I could eat a meal off yeah. it. It's like a table. I could have a cup of coffee. I could write a letter. Yeah. It's right here. And I know a lot of people set at these drums and, and it feels like it's up, up to their neck. But yeah. Same thing with match grip. It's, yeah. it's right there. It's the perfect karate chop where there would be a board, you know, mm -hmm. bam. And I know everyone's uh, f physicality is different, uh, their torsos, legs, you know, it's, it's all a, a different thing. But, you know, every drummer gets asked all the time, what, what's, what's your pedal tension or what, what, you know, should I have my pedal tension at? Well, I don't know. I'm not you. You mm -hmm. might be six foot four. You might have size 12 feet, you know. Don't be daunted at the... Uh, at your journey, everyone's journey is to go through and mess with the, the spring tension and the beater height and your seat height and where your snare drum is and the radius from the hi-hat to the, the snare drum. Don't be daunted by that. Look at that as this is a, a, a beautiful bouquet of choices uh, in front of you. Different doors that you could open and investigate and go, no, this one's not for me, it's kind of cool or it worked for some things and you have to find what works for you. And I don't think enough drummers do that. Every time I'd say, why do you have your hi-hat and snare drum like that? I get two answers from, from all the students. One is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. The other is, because that's how I always do it. Mm -hmm. But why? You have to get into the why and you have to experiment with what works for you and how you could pull a nice sound out of the drum. Um, one more thing is I know you could see, you've got a great angle up here. And I know people will set up their, their bass drums differently. I have my bass drum a little bit like this. So I can angle my toms in because here's the, the natural radius, especially playing traditional grip. I don't have to reach very far to, 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 to get into the center of the drum with my left hand, mm -hmm. right? This is all the natural contour of my body with these toms in. So guys that set up their, their second rack tom, for those that use second rack toms, and put it out here so the center of the drum is here, well, that's a long reach. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to have your ride cymbal out here, it's really, really far, or you can't. So you have to put your ride cymbal here. Yeah. So this is a very natural motion. And people always say, like, dude, your ride cymbal is so high. It's not. It's not high at all. Check this out. Look at, look at my shoulder. Now, if my ride cymbal is down here, there's just th this much of, 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 of an out. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. Now, if I go to the bell, while I'm still young enough to do this, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Uh, I like the feeling of that being in fourth or fifth gear, you know? Yeah, sure. Cause stuff's happening when you're on the bell and I'm never gonna be on the bell for like five minutes in a row. Mm -hmm. That would get tiresome. But again, while I'm still young enough to do to get in the fifth gear, I like the way that feels. I'm sure one day that's going to be down, but I'm going to I'm going to hang on to my early '80s Steve Jordan, Steve Smith, Peter Erskine, Vinnie Caliuta as long as I can. Yeah, absolutely. So, what do you do then? Um, what do you suggest for people to do and just just try new things out and see if it works for them? Is there something that you'll feel when you got it right, or um, because as a beginner, it's daunting to, to to just get it set up the first time, let alone adjust things. And a lot of times, also drummers will find their favorite drummers and they'll just replicate their setup because they want to sound like you know, X drummer. You know what sure. I mean? So, sure. what, what do you suggest for that? Um, if you're honest with yourself and you set something up and it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm your body has a way of telling you, mm -hmm. and you just have to be honest and, and, and listen to it. Um, e even down to a pair of sticks that might be too big or too thin if you get a certain burn or if you have to do change your grip uh, because the size of your hand doesn't work well with the stick. You have to be honest with, with yourself and, and listen to what your body's telling you because your body's not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. And it might take more than, than a day to realize this isn't for you. Mm. Um, but it's fun to experiment and to move things around and to find what's home for you. And that's, you have to be patient and enjoy that process of discovery. And it's something that could go on for a period of years or forever even, you know, and if, 
if that's the way it is, then that's kind of cool yeah. because it's a constant journey. Always evolving. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, I just lowered my chinas. I had them up here. Um, actually, real quick, uh, the reason I had this china up there for so many years was when uh, I toured with Brian Wilson in 1999. Uh, the woman who had become my wife, Taylor Mills, was uh, one of the background singers. And I couldn't see her with my china down here. Uh -huh. So I moved the china up high so we could look at each other so I could see her. Nice. And so I sort of kept that up all those years because um, that kind of, that's where we that's met cool. and fell in love and we got married. And so, uh, but at a certain point now as I'm you know, three years away from 50, that doing the fat all the time was starting to get to be a little bit of a thing. So yeah, yeah. back down they came to right where they were when I was about 25. So there you go. That'll work. So you got making sure you're very loose with your grip, making sure your posture is spot on, mm -hmm. um, talking about your setup now. What other things can help you with getting the best sound out of your drums? Because I think that's what we're kind of going for here, you know? Absolutely. Okay, so First off, I want to say, in, as I launch into this topic, is a drummer must be confident, okay? So for you young drummers out there, you have to have confidence. Mm -hmm. A woman wants a confident man, a band wants a confident drummer. A band does not want a guy who's like, like this, like this, is, is this good? Yeah. L like this, how, how's this? Band wants a guy that's, that's putting it down, it's like this, yes. this is how it's gonna be yeah. right now. Yeah. So. We as drummers, we drive the bus. We, we control the, the, the dynamic levels in the hills and valleys more than you might think. So it's important to, to, to be confident, not cocky, but confident. There's a big difference between the two. Um, so when I would have the students come over, they would ask me about you know, big rock gigs and blah, 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 and I, you know, they want a big rock gig, and I say, well, play me your big rock sound. And nine times out of 10, I get something like this. All right, that's fine. Not very exciting, you know, but not necessarily a big rock sound. And I found that a lot of these drummers, when I listened to their balance, I thought they were kind of a little light on the bass drum. And I wanted a little bit more of this. There's just a little bit, a little bit more butt in that, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a little doom, ga, doom, ga. So what I'm trying to do when I play the drums is I'm trying to mix myself from here, from ground zero. Mm -hmm. So it sounds great whether, you know, you're on stage in an arena or in a club or in a hotel ballroom, whatever. It's gonna sound good to you as the bass player and this person as a keyboard player and out to the if you've got a front of house guy. Now, real quick to backtrack about mixing yourself. When I'm playing that, it's basically like kick, snare, I want the same density, like do, ga, do, ga. I want to be moving the same air, and the hi-hat's sort of the icing on the cake. Now, when I hear young kids play, it kind of sounds a little bit more like this, and I'm not making fun of anyone, okay? I'm just trying to make, make a point. Sure, yeah. So yeah. When, when amateur young drummers play, it sounds like this to me. Okay, so now the bass drum's the softest thing, the hi-hats are the loudest thing. Mm -hmm. If you switch that around, now this sounds professional. Okay. Yes, yes. That, so that sounds like a record and the other one sounds like, you know, keep it up Billy, you're doing great, keep yeah. it up. Um, yeah. So you can't build your building starting on the 10th floor. You have to have your foundation. And this is the foundation. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to get the party started. If you do that in a club, the girls start running on the dance floor, the dudes are buying drinks, mm -hmm. and they go chasing the girls, and the, the club is hopping, and it's packed, and the club owner's happy, and your band gets hired again. There you go. That's yeah. how it happens. Yeah. All you need is a strong foundation, a strong bass drum. Um, so that <laughs> is 
if that sounds good here, mm -hmm. you're over there playing bass, you're like, mm -hmm. damn, that sounds good here. Then the other guy is over here. And when you have, you know, four or five guys, whatever, all agreeing on something, that's a very powerful thing when that hits an audience. How come you could go into a bar and see a band and feel nothing? Totally. And then you can go into another place and see a band and you're like, oh, okay, here we go. Yeah. If everyone is all on that same writing, you know, catching the magic, fairy dust, the ethos, whatever, and you're all agreeing on something, that gets the attention of the audience that something is going on here. And it really starts with how the drummer is mixed. Now, again, playing a hi-hat's a bit softer. Front of house guy. He goes, well, gee, I, this is perfect. Well, maybe I can add a little reverb here. I could make this sound a little sweeter. But if you got a guy that's <laughs> the front of house guy just kills the hi-hat mic because there's so much hi-hat going in the snare mic or the overheads. Mm -hmm. And then he's got to EQ things, roll things off. Your drums don't sound like your drums. If you got a weak bass drum, he's, he's punching that up. And then that sounds lopsided. It's got a weird... Yeah, funky swagger to it, and not funky in a good way. Um, so it's really important to mix yourself and to sound good from right here. Now, that, that being said, there's a, something that I noticed just by looking at a, where a lot of my snare drum activity was. And I thought, gee, you know, a lot of it is about an inch or two up from the center of the drum. And I started thinking, why is that? Well, for one, I want to be sound driven. And apparently, I'm liking where that sounds there. I guess some people are taught that the center of the drum is the loudest part of the drum, and maybe it is for, uh, you know, like rudimental, uh, rudimentary stuff. But in playing rock music and playing rim shots, I find I get a much bigger sound putting the tip of the stick about an inch or two north of the center of the drum, oh, okay. getting a deeper Go rim shot. Overhead. Go to their head cam there. Yeah, getting a deeper rim shot, okay? So I'm going to play four bars hitting the drum in, in, in the center with a rim shot. And then I'm going to play four bars moving it up. Okay. And listen to the sound difference. Actually, I'm going to pull this little gel off here, here a little better. Can you hear that difference? Yeah, big time, yeah. So, much like guitarists <clears throat> might be able to open up their note values as you get from, you know, maybe the uh, uh, verse or pre-chorus into the chorus. <laughs> we can do that with the snare drum just by paying attention to where we're hitting it and with consistency. So we could play the verse here and still have the same sound force, the same snap. And you don't always have to telegraph the chorus with a big fill or a crash. All of a sudden, the snare drum just, mm -hmm. just opens up. Mm -hmm. So those are some things that I like to think about while I'm playing live or especially in, in the studio because those little things are going to... Well, it's those subtle things that, like you said before, it makes you sound from a good drummer to professional drummer, you know? And I think the, the big question that I'm going to obviously ask you is, 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 is how do you practice that? I, I see a lot of drummers, and I think this is uh, um, something that it's to their detriment, where they, they learn a pattern, the first thing they do is they try to find another pattern to learn. They're always looking for another maybe technique or exercise to learn. Where you're just talking about right now is focusing what you're already playing but making it sound good. So, so how do you do that? You, first off, you have to want to make it sound good, mm -hmm. and you have to be patient enough and honest enough to, to listen to it and listen to what other musicians, especially if you're playing with older musicians, listen to them, you know, be humble and, and listen to what they, they have to say. But it's something that, you know, this concept that I'm talking about, I was in my 40s till I, I, I understood it because I had to convey that idea. It was something that I intrinsically, naturally did because these told me it was the right thing to do. Okay. So if at a certain point, if you start being sound driven, or you really let what sound that you're going for make the choice for you. Well, first off, you let the music make the choice for you. Then you have to match 
your, your, your choice on the drums to go with and suit the music. But you, you have to be honest and listen and open your ears and realize that th th you can get a hundred million sounds out of the snare drum, out of the hi-hats, out, out of the cymbals. Um, as a matter of fact, can I talk about the hi-hats for a second? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Th this is one thing that has been sort of a shocker to me because, um, uh, again, all these guys, they have gigs. They, they do gigs. And I would say, hey, play, play me like a, a 16th note. And here's what, you know, sans two or three students. Here's what I got. Okay. With the shoulder. <laughs> Now, this is pretty unsexy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a, you know, HR 16 compared to what I call the, 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 the shank tip, yep. which is on the first methods of mechanics, which is this. Okay. Way so, better. Ladies want to hang with that guy. They don't oh. want to hang with this guy. Not trying to be sexist, I'm just trying to drive a point home that this, the, the, the shank tip, this is something that really separates the, the men from the boys here. Because it's not an up and down motion, it's an in and out motion with a dip in the wrist. So every one of these students that came in and played like that, I said, well, you have the first methods of mechanics, right? Oh, yeah, 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 I do. Did you watch the hi-hat section with the, the shank tip? Oh, yeah, 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 I watched it. Well, again, just because you watched it doesn't mean that you can do it. You have to sit down yeah. and implement this. <laughs> and it's weird for, for people to learn this because all the analogies I've come up with, well, it's like you're shooting pool or you're, you're, you're cutting the steak. Sure, yeah. Or you're, you're fencing, you know, <laughs> or he, here's a, here's a choo-choo train with the wheels and here's the thing that goes like that. That, that is, is the motion. It's in, but you don't continue in. It's in, and you're getting that second note as you pull back. So it's... And you have to, to learn to exaggerate that motion, to, to learn that correctly. So what that ends up becoming is... And that can go all night long mm -hmm. like that. And it sounds better. Mr. Jeff Bricaro. There's no tension there. It, because what, what my, yeah, there's no tension. And what my hand is feeling are the downbeats. So that, that can be employed in other areas of the drum set, but that becomes, once you learn that, that becomes your default way of playing the hi-hat because that chit 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 it's a musical sound, it's like a shaker. And it sounds different than this. It certainly sounds different than this. I love the tongue. Because that's, totally that's how it feels. That's totally like, right. ah. <laughs> like, you can play a five minute song like that. Ah, um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's the, the, the shank tip motion is one of the biggest things that when you see a player, you're like, okay, that's, that's the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one more little bit about getting a better sound, something that's been a little pet peeve of mine sure. uh, kind of all my life. Um, and like to air it right here. If you're going to play a cross stick, please use the butt end. <laughs> please. It, 
It's just a better sound than those who use this. Come in. Come in. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's a sound. If you want to use that sound, that's fine. But, yeah. you know, when, when you hear someone that, that's, that's doing this, or any time you hear Vinnie Cagliuta, it's acrostic. It's just got that oh, clave yeah. pop. Yeah. And this is the only way to get that sound. It's just... That's my public service announcement to the drummers today. Please. There you go. Please use your cross stick here. So the whole getting a better sound starts from all the way down to being loose, setting up your kit the right way, having the right posture. I like when we were talking about this lesson before you were talking about calling it the not so basic basics. And I love that because you think that those are basics and you even talk about them on your methods and mechanics. But like you said, people sometimes gloss over how important those are. Well, I, I even glossed over. I, I felt like if I could go back and do it again, I would, would have spent more time on it mm -hmm. because I, I didn't want to bore some drummers and I also thought, well, you know, I, I guess most most people would, would know this. So I mentioned it, but I didn't spend a ton of time on it until I realized by teaching and doing a couple drum camps overseas and over here that, wait a second, almost no one is, is has up. these ideas down. Well, that's why I say like we get, I mean, obviously with Dromeo, we teach drummers from all skill levels. And the one thing I constantly see is that as soon as they learn a pattern, they just want to move on to the next pattern. They don't focus enough on the how, which is what you're talking about right here. How does it sound? You know, how are you playing? There's so many ways to play you know, one beat, you know, it's, we have different drummers that come in and each person plays the same beat, it'll sound different every time, right? Well, because everyone's heartbeat is, is different, yeah. the way that everyone hits, I and mean, there's so much magic in here and in here that that's a big part of the sound that, that emulates off the drum set. Um, and that sort of segues into something I'd like to talk about here if I could. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, I get asked all the time, being in a band that does 100 plus shows every year, how do you keep the music fresh? And how do you keep, you know, and if you have a gig and you have a set list, whatever, you know, you could be playing in a wedding band or whatever, it doesn't matter. When you're playing the same songs over and over again, how do you keep it fresh? Well, for me, a mental thing is, well, it's a new audience. And maybe these people have never seen the band before or have never seen me play drums before. And maybe someone was like, I've been waiting for this for three months or I've had my tickets. So I can't be like, oh, it's been 17 days on the road. I just need to get home for a couple days. I can't take any energy like that on the stage. So first off, you have to love your drums. When you get behind your drum set, you have to be like a, a kid on Christmas morning. And you go, I can't believe I get to play these, these wonderful drums and cymbals. Two... You have to play for them. Mm -hmm. And the music has to sort of become reborn every night. And you have to put that excitement that this thing is a live, living organism that's happening right in front of you. Again, that's why you might walk into a bar and hear a band and it feels like they're looking at their watches and the one guy's taking a sip of beer in between chords and they're just punching the clock. And then you go see another band and something magical totally has happened. Yeah. So like when I, when I toured with Brian Wilson, I did his first solo tour in 99, playing songs like Fun, Fun, Fun and Surf in USA, and things like that have literally been played millions of times by bar bands, garage bands, uh, wedding bands, whatever, right? So what would make this different now that I'm playing these songs that have played millions and millions of times with the guy who wrote and sang them live in, an, in a theater or whatever, mm -hmm. I had to put that excitement into that sort of feel. So yeah. if I'm playing something like, uh, That has to feel like, yeah. yeah, we're in the car and we're going to the beach and there's gonna be chicks and we're drinking beers. You know, it has to, <laughs> it has to convey that. It, that has to just emanate off the stage. That, Holy smokes, I'm seeing, this is real. Yeah. This isn't just some, another bar band. I gotta call my wife, gotta pick up the dry cleaning. Got, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It has to be real. 
and be born again night after night. And you find that a challenge for yourself, or do you, or you can zone in and do that every night you're, pl you're playing? It, it's, it's rarely a challenge mm -hmm. because that spirit takes over. Mm -hmm. And if I'm feeling like under the weather or I'm sore, all I have to do is look at someone else in the band and it's like, okay, yeah, all right, we're all in this together. Yeah. And with Sticks, that's, that's an amazing thing because those guys are like 20 years my senior and they leave it all on the stage. It doesn't matter if we're in a field in Nebraska or in New York City. Everyone gets the same show. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to be the one that's dragging my butt up there when yeah, yeah. you got guys in their 60s that are going to be carrying me. Nope, it's no. not going to go down that way. No, it's not going to go down that way. Um, yeah. Very cool, man. Well, we're getting close to the hour. Um, I know you have a couple more things to, to talk about, and you also have another tune you want to play with us as well, talk about how you can play with lower dynamics, still get that impact in there. Yes. Um, well, I, I, had a, I had a learning experience, again, with something that I intrinsically knew mm -hmm. but rarely employ. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this before I change over the, the, the snare drum and, and hats. Um, so I was up in uh, Toronto, Canada. Yeah. Uh, which is by the capital, capital city. Toronto, no, Canada City. You know, the capital. Yeah, I yeah, know the capital. I blew the punchline. Um, and I, I was doing a session where I was replacing uh, another drummer. So the track was finished. And the part was, was pretty simple and laid out. And the piece of music was like, uh, you know, Queen meets uh, Foo Fighters meets the Who era Quadrophenia, or, or Quadrophenia era the Who, rather. Yeah. And so the information told me that I should be playing it like this. And I think the groove is something along these lines. All right, so I was, I was beating the hell out of the drums, right? Yeah. So I, I go in and I listen to the, the first take and no one's heads are bobbing. All the, the parts are right. It sounds good, but seemingly kind of beige. Mm. Kind of like a hamburger from a hospital. <laughs> hamburger from a hospital. It doesn't, it's not That's cooked so with good. love. It's like, this will do. Yeah. But no one's heads were bobbing. There's no smiles, no high fives. And when you're a session player, you have to go through the Rolodex and come up with solutions very fast. Mm. And I thought, you know what? The drums sound thin in this room, playing them hard. So I told the engineer, I said, hey, change all the mic levels. I'm gonna go out there and play it uh, much quieter. So I, I, I played it something like this. Well, I went into the control room and everyone's sitting at the, at the console going, yeah. high five in each other, and I'm sitting back there, and I'm like, <laughs> but you know, I gotta be kinda cool about it. Like, what did you do differently? Well, what, what had happened with this particular track, in this particular room, or in that particular room, with those particular mics, on that particular day, that notion won the day. Playing it lighter made the drums sound bigger. You could hear the bottom heads. You could hear the snares rattle on the snare. The cymbals were oceanic and were like waves of water hitting you. And in doing that, some of the guitar lines actually were clearer hmm. to hear. It was less, yeah, but yeah. more, there's more of an, under, an earthy undercurrent. And it rocked way harder it sounded so much cooler, it sounded so much bigger. Um, so that was a big learning experience. It's especially in the studio that the drums can often sound bigger depending on the piece of music and depending on the studio. They can sound bigger if you don't beat the hell out of the drums. Mm. Interesting, so yeah. we're gonna see the comparison or we're gonna see what you mean by that. Here. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna play to a track that is definitely sort of an English style of, uh, uh, I call it a, 
droopy dog smoking a Sherlock Holmes pipe type <laughs> drumming. Okay, well I'm looking forward to it. You're gonna change your snare and hi-hats too? Yeah, and I'm gonna change this guy out too here. All right, well you go ahead and start doing that. Uh, while Todd's doing that, everyone, uh, we might not have time for many questions today, but get them in if you can, just submit below. And uh, we're also doing an interview slash Q&A type of lesson with uh, Todd just for the Edge members tomorrow, so we'll get to all the questions that we missed today for that. Also, we are gonna be doing a course with Todd, and it's gonna be kind of expanding on this, what we're talking about here right now, which is the not so basic basics of drumming and how to get your sound to sound better, um, your drum story to sound better, and your overall sound to sound more professional. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of cool things in there. Um, I also wanna say, let's give away this uh, DVD, uh, two DVDs here. We've got the Method and Mechanics number one, volume number one and volume two, along with the Todd Sukerman Method and Mechanics book. Comes with a CD accompaniment as well. So what we're gonna do is, like normal with our YouTube lessons, as soon as this hits YouTube, we're gonna give you 30 days from the release date, and we're gonna choose the best comment. So just basically, well, we'll choose it at random, but try to put something on there saying what you liked the most about this lesson today or about Todd's playing, and then within 30 days, we'll pick a random winner and we'll send you both Methods and Mechanics 1 and Methods and Mechanics 2. Very cool stuff, and if you like what he's talking about here, you're definitely gonna to wanna to check that out because he goes into much more detail with that. I think I'm gonna keep these hats on here. So it's just gonna be easier because... Sure. Yeah, because I gotta, I gotta switch them back, and that's one less thing I gotta do. Sounds good. Uh, we got the track set up for you, ready to roll, so uh, whenever you're ready, just let us know. All right. All right.
really nice. Sounded big, even though I can, I'm sitting right beside you. I know you weren't digging in very hard, but it sounded really no, good. No, well, I didn't mean to hit that last symbol that hard, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Very no, cool. it, it's, that's, that's fun to play, and that's hard. That type of drumming is hard for me to do. It's easier for me to play quickly and, and fast than, than this. So I, when I record a piece of music like that song with that type of drumming, I actually get more satisfaction out of it because it's, I'm playing music. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm, yeah. I'm conveying an idea. I'm getting behind the song. When, when, when you're playing the drums and you're you're being subservient to the music and lyrically what the song is about if you know what the song is then you, you can attach a, a mood or a melancholy or something to that piece of music and truly be part of the storytelling process than yeah. just being a backbone or playing eight bars crash eight bars crash totally very responsible play yeah <laughs> thank yeah. Safe. safe very safe playing very safe playing. <laughs> no very responsible for the song <laughs> yes yeah um let's get us some questions Okay, cool? yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this out while we're doing that. So sure, sounds good. Yeah, you can answer and talk at the same time. Um, we got a lot of questions. So again, like I said before, we'll get to these in Drumio uh, Edge tomorrow. We'll do a Q&A and we'll capture all the rest of the questions. And if you guys are watching this and you aren't Edge members, you can sign up. We have a, a monthly and a yearly membership for uh, lessons that we're basically releasing every day. We have courses by all the special guests that we bring in and we will be doing one with Todd as well. Um, so if you like what you're seeing on YouTube, we have have a lot more in-depth material inside of Dromeo. You can go to dromeo.com slash trial to get a free trial and uh, let us know if you guys had any questions about that. Uh, okay, here's a question for you, Todd. Yes, sir. Uh, this is from AC Sticks. He says, any suggestions for keeping motivated to practice and keeping playing through the tough times where you feel like giving up? It's a great question. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It's hard. We all go through... Uh, mental blocks, roadblocks, hitting brick walls, times where we aren't enjoying what we're hearing. In, in those times, maybe take a step back and go see some other drummers. Go see some live music. Go to a museum. Go for a walk in the park. Kind of clear your head. Kind of do a... Mm -hmm. And then sit back at the drums and get back to them slowly. Kind of like, hi, it's nice to see you again. We're gonna have some fun today. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it, it's kind of true. If, if I'm, here's something that we all experience as musicians. Sometimes I'll get on stage and I'll be like, are these my drums? Are these my pedals? Are these the shoes I normally, you know, drum in? Are these my drumsticks? Everything feels like a weird alternative universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, and nothing feels right. When that happens to me, you can't force magic. You have to take a step back and I go, <sighs> so let's say the first two songs sucked. In my mind, the show starts now, mm. the third song. So you kind of get rid of the bad juju and you, you start again. But you can only do that by relaxing, playing less, playing uh, less forcefully, because you can never force magic, you can never force that round peg into the square hole. Yeah. So that's, it's the same thing with, with practicing. You have to find something, it helps if you have something to practice for, mm. you know. Um, but yeah, that's something that we all go through, but just, you gotta keep working through it. There you go, yeah, great, great, great suggestions there. Here's a question from Sammy A. Asks, with the louder kick thing you were talking about, do you have any thoughts on wooden beaters or felt beaters that will give more volume? I've always been worried about wooden beaters. They might sound too harsh when mic'd. Um, what do you think about that? Well, um, for years and years I've been using a Danmar disc, a plastic disc, if, I, if I'm playing rock music, mm -hmm. um, and a pillow in my bass drum. Um, and it just, it works, it yeah. works. Uh, and for years when I started using the Danmar disc, I'd say to the engineer, okay, what sounds better, A or B? And I'd play the, the, the right pedal, A, with it hitting the Danmar disc, and then the left pedal not hitting the Danmar disc. 100% mm -hmm. of the time, they said A. Hmm. Um, I just recently did a, a session at East West with uh, the famous Ed Cherney mixing. We spent about 30 seconds on the bass drum. Really? You just know, it just, it just, boom. Yeah. For, when I'm playing rock music and going for Spike, I don't play in Led Zeppelin, so I don't go for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I have a Danette bass drum <laughs> in yeah, my okay. studio if I want that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, you just open up your bass drum. 
but for me, this, this, this works. So cool. uh, it, it is a very hard sound to answer your question. And the nice thing about a Danmar disc is I've never broken a bass drum head with a Danmar disc. So I, really? I, I, could, I could, with sticks, my bass drum heads will stand for about six months. And we change them just because we figured, oh, we've pushed it enough. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's, let's change. Better it. safe than sorry. Yeah. Uh, on the lines of the bass drum, uh, Joe P asks, I see a lot of drummers burying their beater into the head when they play. Rather than bouncing it off the head, uh, you wouldn't bury your stick into the snare without pulling it back, So, because it definitely sounds different. So what are your thoughts, and uh, what do you find engineers ask you to do on that? Uh, I've never had an engineer a ask me to play my bass drum differently. Um, I know a lot of people have opinions over bearing or not bearing the, the beater. I do both. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just whatever feels better. And sometimes I do bury my stick into the snare drum. Sometimes that feels good mm -hmm. to me. Uh, an example, this. It's a, different, it's a different sound and a different vibe than... It's another, it's another choice mm -hmm. in the, the, the palette of, of colors. I wouldn't recommend doing that, and I'm sure one day I might recommend ever talking about that. Uh, so it <laughs> but might until hurt me. then, until then. But until then, while I'm still have a, I'm holding on to a little bit of fleeting youth. Um, here's a here's a follow-up question to that. Uh, do you think it's worth people worrying about burying the beater or not? Because I see a lot of people, especially in forums these days, they go back and forth about you, you, know, you should never bury your beater, you should never not bury your beater. Um, do you think it's even important to worry about? No, it? I say who the hell cares? <laughs> who the hell cares? When you're listening to a record, are, 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 is that what you're thinking about? Exactly, yeah. Are, are you listening to, to Gavin Harrison play with Porcupine Tree and you're wondering if he's bearing the beater or not? Yeah. It doesn't matter if he is or is not, and maybe sometimes he is, and maybe sometimes he's not. It's how does it sound? That's the end result. If you <coughs> want to hold your sticks like this and you can play all the ideas that you want and you get the sound that you want, who's to say that that's wrong? Exactly. Um, you know, on an open bass drum, it's going to be more obvious, the, the different sounds. And, you know, a guy like Joe Mayer can talk for literally five hours about pedal technique and bass drum sounds. I'm not that guy. Um, but to me, it, I don't care. Yeah. So for, for, if, if you're worried about that, I think there's, I think there's many other things that are, are, are more important to, to be worried about. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what I'm interested in doing is, is giving you guys some ideas to make you just sound better on, on, on the drum set. If, if, if I came in here and my lesson today was entitled uh, 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 playing septuplets, you know, grouped over nines, who the hell am I helping? <laughs> you know, I'm just showing you how clever I am and how I've spent my time at the instrument. I but, love it. Yeah, but, yeah. But this is, I want, what the world needs is more people with ears that are responding to music correctly and emotionally. And that's, an, that's another thing real quick. Emotion has a big part to do with this. This is a very emotional thing. Music uh, in, in lyrics or music without lyrics can make me burst into tears. Mm -hmm. And if your impetus is to think that I'm a wussy for, for saying that, I would come back to you saying, maybe you're not as good a musician as you think you are, because you should be in touch with deep emotions like that, and you should be comfortable with emotions like that, because then and only then can you pull things out of, of your playing that is, is going to match the beauty of the music that you're hopefully playing with. That's why you know Steve Gadd can play one little thing, uh, or Steve Jordan can play one little thing, and I, f I feel like I've just fallen off my chair. Yeah, yeah. That, that oh, I agree, man. There's an emotion, and, yeah. and that, that transcends technique or the minutia of how someone hits a drum. It doesn't friggin' matter. I love it. So we're lo running low on time, so we're going to leave the rest of the questions for tomorrow because okay. there's a lot. And I'm really, in, uh, gonna, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that because uh, your answer is you've got so much experience and you have such a, a unique approach to it, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how you deal with these other questions. But we'll leave it at that for now. Again, if you guys wanted to catch that, you can sign up for Drumio. It'll be in the archives if you're watching this on YouTube as well. Um, again, huge thanks to the sponsors for helping bring Todd out here. Pearl, Thank you, guys. Remo, Sabian, um, Promark Sticks, Audix, Symbols or Audix mics, sorry, <laughs> Audix mics, Carmichael Throne, and of course, Ron Denet, who's back there as well, who's uh, provided the snare using for us right now. Um, Todd, thank you so much for coming out thank you, brother. to Dromeo, buddy.
Well, yeah. a couple closing statements and, uh, yes. and a, uh, I'll play a little bit at the end. Absolutely. Uh, Todd's going to, uh, he's got something to say to wrap things up. But before he does that, I just want to say again for you guys wanting to win the Method of Mechanics DVD pack, uh, one and two, as well as the book, just leave a comment below the video of what you thought is the best part of this lesson. And within 30 days of us posting it, we will choose a winner and send it out your way. Again, thanks everyone for watching. Hope to see you on Drumio. Todd, I'll leave it to you now, man. All right. Well, I, I always sort of end my drum clinics with, with some sentiments like this. Um, if you want to do this for your livelihood, you have to really put in the time and be serious about it and not let the distractions of modern life get in the way. Because there's a lot of people that want to do this. Um, and you have to do it with the notion that doing anything else with your life would be preposterous. So you have to give it your all and study and listen and play music and just live, eat, and, and breathe this. And there are certain things that you can do on top of that to really, that, that will enhance the chances of you getting to where you want to go um, on your local scene, on the national scene, on the international scene. And there are certain, there's five things that a lot of musicians don't put together. Number one is be on time, always, always be on time. Always, no excuses, ever. As a matter of fact, be early. Number two, be prepared for the job. Someone calls you, you're going to go to rehearsal, learn 25 songs, the gig's the next day. Learn all 25 songs. Learn them. Know them backwards and forwards. Number three, bring the right tools for the job. Bring great gear. Bring the right choices, the right tools for the job. Number four, maybe the hardest one, nail the job, kill the gig. And then, number five, leave everybody happy that you were there. The world has enough grumpy people and grumpy musicians, you know, bitching and pissing and moaning about this, that, or the other thing. Don't be one of those guys. On time, be prepared, right tools for the job, nail the job, leave everybody happy that you were there. Put those five things together. Give yourself six months or 12 months. See what happens. I guarantee you that's going to be a, a catapult you to where you want to go. Now, conversely, if you don't want to do this for your livelihood, still be involved in music. Still be involved in drumming. And you know what? If it's not drumming, maybe it's guitar playing. Maybe it's piano. Maybe it's painting or sculpting. Something, anything that you can get lost for an hour or two every day and get lost in creating. Because it's such a, such a beautiful, cathartic uh, healing experience to be involved in that. And even if you just play gigs on weekends or you play in your basement with friends, be involved. Don't quit. Keep playing drums. Keep studying. People play golf knowing that they're never going to play for their green jacket or whatever. You know, keep doing this. And drummers are some of the coolest people on the planet because who else does this type of thing? Who else has drum festivals and drum clinics and all my life, drummers have been my, some of my favorite people and some of my oldest and dearest friends. So our way of life has to endure because that's what makes us special, what we have in our life. In our lives, <laughs> we would never be shooting and bombing and killing each other if everyone in the world did this. So keep it up, all right? I'm going to play and see what happens now that I'm not warmed up anymore. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>